Okay, this is Coffee Talk for, Coffee Talk for the morning of Tuesday, February 25th. It's 10.04. Um, and I have some email that I saved from yesterday that I wanted to go ahead and go through. Um, that will spawn some interesting conversation. Uh, the first one is the Linux ProtonMail bridge. So if you haven't heard about it yet, and if you've played around with ProtonMail, uh, if you're a Linux user, you need to request um, the bridge through support. Uh, it's not completely obvious who to send the email to, so I'll just put it here. It's support at protonmail.zendesk.com. If you send them an email and say, hey, I'm a Linux user, it can be the download files. Otherwise, you'll be blocked because it's, um, it's listed as being under beta and the links to download it are not available. Why do you care? Well, ProtonMail Bridge lets you use any email client that you want. So you can use MUT for the terminal, which I'll be setting up soon here. And you can use um, Thunderbird or you know Outlook, whatever whatever you want. And that's really the, the advantage, the value proposition of that. So I'll be installing that at another time. But I just want to make people aware of it. Uh, Open Source Highlights is a good um, news group to subscribe to. Um, and we're going to go over it, but I want to just first tell you about some of these news groups as I encounter them. Uh, forward this email to a friend, subscribe here. Um, if you just go to opensource.com, they have a newsletter you can sign up for, and they have a lot of great stuff. They run out of Raleigh, so they're, they tend to be Red Hat specific, um, but that's okay. So, what else we got? Uh, I did, there's a couple, um, there's a couple of link, uh, stories here that I won't go into detail on that I want to make you aware of. Um, how Linux is our love language, that's pretty good. Uh, but this is a good one. So why developers like to code at night? Um, this is particularly interesting to me. Uh, I read the whole thing. And it goes through the science of burnout and the science of um, productivity. And lately that's been on my mind a lot. In fact, I've uh, been trying to make my schedule here. As you can see, I there's not much time. And I was finding I was experiencing a little bit of burnout last week, having streamed for my first month and realizing it was impossible for me to get time for other important things if I didn't change something. So, pause. <laughs> Let me just try to pause there. I need something easier than that to listen to. It's a bit too much sex. There we go. Um, so, uh, so I just wanted to say something about the burnout thing. Um, and also just talk about the calendar. This calendar will be placed eventually on the site and I'm working on a Google calendar for that so that I can manage my own time. I want to go through it a couple of week or two to make sure I can actually maintain it. Um, and one of the interesting things I, th I felt, I'll just to take away from the, burn from the thing, was that the people who get burned out the most are the people who love what they do the most. So they don't stop. They just keep doing it. <laughs> they keep doing what they love. Um, and so they end up, here's actually... Um, they end up they end up doing things that um, they normally wouldn't do. Uh, it's an interesting recent Perl post. I didn't see that before. Um, so indulging in your uh, okay, sleep your brain when you get a good brain, all that jazz. I kind of say as a developer, that's really important that you understand what, how well your brain works. Your brain is your number one tool next to your fingers. Be careful of your hands, man. I mean, I've had people you know break a finger or something, and they're kind of pretty much out of commission. So you know, almost take out insurance on your hands um so uh you know you have to understand how your brain works and if you don't you know you're going to be <laughs> you're going you're gonna to be really confused because i did notice for example i'll go back to the calendar again since this is the topic that at night my brain doesn't work as well i mean and that just makes sense right um late late at night uh because of the concentration sometimes i've had good good you know coding sessions Another conclusion was is that most people who get stuff done um, do it in half day chunks. So, you know, four hours of solid work with minimal breaks and no distractions. So that kind of work is going to be very hard for any live streamer. And in fact, I have, you know, 
raged against the concept of pair programming before because you always have that person there, you know, bothering you sort of. <laughs> but then again, as, as we've seen on the stream, um, sometimes that extra person can help you avoid a lot of lost time because they can help you see a problem that you don't, that you don't necessarily see. So I don't know what I think about that, but I do know that getting focused time to do coding is super important. And if you don't have it, you won't be productive, at least not as a programmer, and, and definitely not as a cybersecurity. If you're going to do bug bounty, bug bounty is even more mentally intensive so far than coding because you are problem solving constantly. If somebody comes down and enters the room and says, hey, how's it going? You've lost everything. And unless your brain is even on top of its game, it's going to be really hard to get back. Uh, so particularly when you're in really hairy code, you're like, you got a whole algorithm in your head and somebody says something, they don't think it'd be, it's, they think it's pretty innocuous, but then all of a sudden, boom, it's all out of your head. So um, as you, you know, plan your day to become uh, this kind of, you know, person, uh, you really need to think about where your your focus times are going to be. And if that means going to a different room, which, you know, I really need, I really need a studio, I can just lock it if I'm going to continue to do this. Um, but, uh, you know, or, or how, or, or at least planning your time so that when you're getting interrupted, you're fine. Uh, so I'm spending an, an inordinately long amount of time on the scheduling thing because to me that was really important. It was an important read. I read through this whole thing. I read through the avoid the avoiding burnout. Uh, I read about self care, taking care of yourself, taking time off, asking to work from home, uh, putting things on do not disturb. Of course, if you're on Slack, that's not a thing. You can't really do that. I'm going to turn the music off. And um, you know, just uh, turning things off and getting a great amount of sleep. And that's really it. And I think other than that, if you really like it, if you really enjoy what you're doing and you make sure to, to vary it up, you're going to be fine. That's my hypothesis anyway. We're going to find out because <laughs> I'm going to try it. But if you haven't noticed, that's why I have so much fun at night. And I don't mind doing lessons at night, but my priority at night is having fun. This is, this, you know, you guys have taken my game time, you know, and I, and I want that. I want to do more with that time. Hmm. So if I can help people and have fun at the same time, we both win because I get to chill. All right. So, um, and for me, talking is very relaxing. So it's not a, it's not, it's not work. Um, all right. So, so this is the schedule. Uh, I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to get some quiet time in the morning to make more videos that get posted and take care of yourself. You make sure you get, for me, it's 7.5 hours exactly. I have to get, so understand your brain, know when your best brain time is. When I was in college, I got up early and went up to the lab at 6 a.m. and I got all of my stuff done before. And I was I found that my, my reading and everything was so much better. I could do the same thing in an hour that take me like four hours at, home, at night. So uh, another thing, focused live coding. So I'm kind of on the fence about this. Um, if I'm actually going to get real coding done, that means I can't look at the chat all the time. So uh, that's not the definition of live coding if I wanted to qualify to be on the live coding team, which might be fun is that you take questions from the group, but there definitely needs to be a moment where you can get into an algorithm and really think it through and then like look up from the algorithm and go, okay, you know, or perhaps you're stuck, you know, and then you look over, you know, look over at the, at the chat. So, so that's my intent. Um, I won't always have a cam on for that just because, um, I don't just one less thing I want to worry about. And I definitely don't want to have to worry about lighting my eyes. Uh, but speaking of which, um, the light, one of the things from this article says is that, that, not, that light in front of a screen, and I, and I presume because of these lights here in the studio, that it actually messes up your circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm, not circadian, and that makes you not sleep. So um, that's interesting. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to put my head around what that means for streamers because streamers have got lights on all the time. So does that keep them from sleeping and that make, does that, does that take away from their, their normal amount of sleep? You know, drinking coffee late at night, obviously that does. So lots of things that I'm going to be exploring here. I, but I kind of want to hit it. I want to nail it because if we can figure this out, you know, we can encourage other people to do what we're doing. And I tell you what, I know a lot of coders right now that wouldn't dream of doing this. They're, they'd be like, no way, man, I got too much to do. So we, if we're going to, you know, expand our ability to have people share what they're doing um, and you know, teaching by example, we need to figure out how to do this so we can help them do it. Okay. So I spent a lot, 10 minutes on that, but that's fine. Um, let's see, what else did I have in my email? So um, extend the life of yesterday. Yeah, no, no. Automate your live demos with shell scripts. Yes. 
Um, music composition with Python and Linux, not interested right now. The system and career story, that's kind of a fun one. Um, the state of enterprise, open source, free online. Uh, 10 things I wish I'd known before becoming a system administrator. <laughs> Seven time wasting habits to kick in 2020. So this is a good um, mailing. I suggest you go give it a shot, opensource.com. I will put this in um, past weekly newses just because... Um, okay, so I left this one in here. This is, you know, it's, I take it with a grain of salt. This is a, this is a marketing sort of, you know, newsletter for all the, it claims to be news, but it's really more about promoting everything in Raleigh. Um, but there is some pretty interesting stuff here. So the one that came up was, let's see, uh, where is it? Oh, here we go. Startups headed for another dot com bust. Okay, so this and I read part of this. There's another one, another tweet about this. Um, and this is again, this is New York Times, so we're going to be blocked from this probably. Mm. And I talked about this, um, I talked about this earlier, um, or last night. Uh, so I'm going to give you the, the really quick version. So back in what 2000 and 2000, here it is. The, pro, the pullback is, will probably not be as severe as the dot-com bust in the early 2000s. I lived through that and survived it by switching over to do system administration and support instead of applications development. So the, the moral of the story there is learn both coding and system administration, particularly Linux. And if you do, you will be able to survive the, the switch. When, when the economy goes bad and when everybody's putting all their money into new applications or dot-coms things, then it goes bust. They pull all of that. All those application developers are looking for jobs. And you have to be a 10x programmer anyway. So so then you can shift back over and do systems administration or systems support or DevOps and that kind of thing. Particularly if you're a Linux person. So, so I believe everybody should learn Linux first. Even if you're going to be nothing but a web app developer. And you're, even if you're going to do Kotlin on Java. Learn to do it on Linux. Because those skills will translate everywhere. And if you don't believe me... Go watch Linus's last, Linus um, Does Tech has a fantastic video. I watched the whole thing last night. Um, and he does a video about why Linux is the thing, you know. And let's see here. Linux gaming doesn't suck. <laughs> um, I, you guys know who Lin Linus is, right? So Linus Does Tech. Go look up his li latest video on Linux. And it talks about why it's so dominant. I do think it's funny because the guy who sticks his head in talks about it's really good new Linux. And no, it's not. It's never, never been that. The, and if you don't understand that, you could go ahead and read um, Mr. Watt's book. All right. So uh, the pullback will probably not be as severe. Today, venture capitalists and other investors still have large pools of money to invest in certain types of startups. Uh, like those that make tech for businesses and that technically have steady sales. So last night during coffee, uh, during our just fun time, we were talking about how fun it would be to make a company that provides um, cyber services or cybersecurity services and, and sets, helps them set up bug bounty for tech, for tech companies. And there is a solid, solid business demand for that. So if that is your thing, you know, learn your cybersecurity, learn your web that goes with cybersecurity and then go on. All right. Um, so there definitely is sort of a, a dot-com bust happening right now. So that's probably why you're having a hard time finding a job if you're a junior developer. Any developers these days are having a hard time finding a job, let alone the ones they can get at home. So you know, count your lucky stars if you have any work in software development right now. And while you're at it, learn Linux. Learn Linux is first. By the way, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. Learn really well learn the Linuxes that will get you certified and go get your Linux essential certification go get your LPIC one those are solid certifications even though they're multiple choice because they're generated and developed and maintained by the Linux Foundation and the whole group there they're unlike like maybe some of the comp TIA certificates so focus on those and get that Linux certificate and that'll be just the extra little thing in there in that in that um stack of skills that you have where you can you know show up to work and say hey i can i can take care of that system oh you need somebody to help take care of that system great since we're not working on that application project anymore maybe i can step in and help you over there that's gonna keep you employed and i've seen it i've done it so hmm uh, 
bit of, a little bit of music to calm down. After all, it's only 10, 19 in the morning. For me, that's um, still pretty early because I, I stepped out later because of our American time zone here. My midnight is, is California's 9 o'clock, so <laughs> a lot of people might want to watch. Um, all right, so let's turn this down. The Makers, this is cool too, the maker schedule. According to Paul Graham, people who produce stuff tend to adhere to that maker's schedule. They prefer to use time in units of a half day or longer. In fact, most developers have the same preference. Okay, so that's where that comes from. It says if you break up in 10 to 15 minutes chunks, you're not going to do that. We covered that. If you're constantly getting distracted, forget any kind of serious flow state work. And if you don't understand that, go read a book called Deep Work. Deep Work. Um... So, this is a great book. Um, let's see if I can find it. Five Practices from Deep Work. So, Deep Deep Work is a book uh, for how to learn to use your time better. And, and so, the biggest takeaways are flow state. Flow state is that that thing that happens to you when you can't tell how far away you are going from from. I mean, you haven't the hours just melt by. Distracting yourself with social media. Yes, yes, social media can be distracting, but it also can be a critical source of new information. So I don't, I don't think you should consider social media um, to be a bad thing. Um, uh, use commutes, exercise, cleaning, or other repetitive tasks to work out concepts. That's true. Prioritize their four DX framework. Yep, we talked about that. Uh, this is this is um, the, the well. That's everybody talks about that. They all make money in different ways. Not the same idea. Notice your shallow work. To better avoid it. Yeah, shallow work is the kind of work that I do when I have other things going on, and it works better at night. So that's actually a good article. I'm going to go ahead and, and link this, um, and call it call it good. All right. Um, what else we got? So, do 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 do. do. I'm going to close this one down. I'll close this one down. All right. The Wall Street Journal. So that was a good article. Uh, the, the bubble is real. So prepare for it by learning Linux, making sure you have Linux skills. Why Linux? Because Linux is the everywhere. Watch Linux does Linux. Let's see. I'm going to I'm going to find it for sure because I tried to find it before I couldn't find it. So Linus does tech, right? Let's go find his channel. I should probably just go look on YouTube. What am I doing here? Um, do, 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 Linus tech tips. There it is. All right. So here we can see. Uh, I'm going to go find his video since it's not, but it's scrappy. So one of it, there it is. Ten, 10 ways Linux is just better. And this is actually really good. So Windows on the desktop, which may be true, but everyone knows that if you need reliability for, say, the servers that run the internet or store all of our cloud data, Linux is the only way to go. I mean, heck, even heck. Microsoft heck. uses Linux to run Azure. Let's talk about why. This is the top 10 reasons Linux is just plain better, according to our community. There you go. According to our community, he said. Thanks to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Right. It's the free to play so online strategy so game. He, he, with he a breaks GUI. it down. That leads perfectly into number two software, software management, uh, everything, performance. And he talks about the command line at the very end, which I thought was funny. Is portable. We're gonna watch the command but line. But recently one. taken to calling it. This is bullshit. <laughs> what this guy is saying over here is absolute total bullshit, and it's actually directly controverted by what's in William Schott's section about why he doesn't call it GNU Linux. So just ignore him. Plus Linux. Linux is not an operating system unto itself, but yes, it rather is. another free component of a fully functioning. Yeah, GNU it's like the major node component of the whole thing. So no bullshit. System. Yes, yes, I knew that. Back on topic, <laughs> number eight is portability. When you no, need no, to no, troubleshoot no, no. Wait, 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 some GNU plus process a multi-stage job. Wait, 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 where is it? And error data can be extraneous movements, no unnecessary clicks, any other shells that allow you to you run go. all the various he functions of your chosen distro, list. and even automate some of the tasks thanks to the ability to write and implement scripts for the OS. The terminal is all about efficiency. No extraneous movements, no unnecessary clicks. If you like a GUI and the efficiency of the terminal, i3 window manager is for you. Who needs a mouse, right? It's a lean, mean coding machine, literally. 
Another reason to use the terminal yeah, is that I input, I output, I thought about and doing error I data can be easily. But I actually do web development, so you need a mouse anyway. You can't you can't do web development without a mouse. Period. People who try to do it with a touchpad are retarded. <laughs> I don't. You know, I don't really mean that, right? I mean, they're obviously not, and that's a bad word to use. But the point is, is that yeah, command line is great, but the mouse isn't bad either. There's times when when visual things are needed, and when you need that, you really need a mouse redirected, allowing information to be sent or received from files or other applications. This functionality allows the use of one-liners, one which are single commands that use multiple tools to process a multi-stage job. Yay. Boy, Linux is cool, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I just like uh, to interject. I don't want to listen to this guy. This guy's a typical GNU Linux person, okay? And the reason I disagree with that is because I'm going to read it to you because this because how much time I got? Yep, I got time. So if you go out and you read a much better book from a much, much, much more experienced Linux person, William Schatz, who's been doing it his whole life, and you go read his PDF, and then you go read, well, we're not going to wait for a stupid PDF to download. I hate the stupid SourceForge thing. This shows how old he is because he's using SourceForge still. Um, anyway, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to just open this one, which is in our downloads. And I'm gonna, I want to get this one thing for you so you can, you can understand what I'm talking about. Um, Pardon me. So let's go into the to the desktop to go into the downloads. Um, by the way, if you don't know, that is the free book. That's a like a twenty dollar book on Amazon for free. Uh, most people don't know that because they don't put it anywhere. They certainly don't put it in the Amazon listing. Somebody needs to make a review, like maybe me, and say, "Hey, you can go get this thing." Uh, he's just he's just being that guy for the sake of the video because those dudes are out there. Okay, that makes me feel much better. I don't know Andy very well. I've seen him three times, and he's he seems very nice. The first time I saw him, and then he then I saw him doing that, and I was like, "Oh, you're that guy." <laughs> it's like you're that guy, you know. So, anyway, if you go to where's my downloads? Download, download, downloads. Here we go. Hey. Oh, someone's hanging me. Hi there, my name here. Um, all right, so let's see here. Um, let's see. Do, 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 where is, I just want to read you the paragraph about GNU Linux. Uh, this is something I go over in the book, of course. Uh, and again, the book is free. You can download the PDF from linuxcommand.org. Uh, yeah, you guys control me all you want, but I just, you know, if you abuse it, I'll turn it off. End of story. Um, I don't mind. stop bashing on things that I see that without explanation. So we're going to go down here and then we're going to go find um okay, so this is for Karen tell you a story what this book is about, who should read it uh common tools, how to read this book, no no, alright, there it is, here it is all right, why I don't call it GNU Linux? In some quarters, it's politically correct to call the Linux operating system the GNU Linux operating system. The problem with Linux is that there is no completely correct way to name it because it was written by many different people in a vast distributed development effort. Technically speaking, Linux is the name of the operating system's kernel and nothing more. The kernel is a very important, of course, since it makes the operating system go, but it's not enough to form a complete operating system. Enter Richard Stallman, the genius philosopher who founded the Free Software Foundation movement, started the Free Software Foundation, formed the GNU project, wrote the first version of GNU C compiler, created the GNU general public uh, license, and I would say, and I would add, it's created the first open core business model. He insisted that you call it GNU Linux to properly reflect the contributions of the GNU project. While the GNU project predates the Linux kernel, the project contributions are extremely deserving of recognition. Placing him in the name is unfair to everyone else who made significant contributions. Besides, I think Linux, Linux GNU would be more appropriate given the fact that the kernel boots first. In popular usage, Linux refers to the kernel and all the other free and open source software found in a typical Linux distribution. That is, the entire Linux ecosystem, not just the GNU components. The operating system marketplace seems to prefer one name such as DOS, Windows, Mac, Solaris, IRIX, and AIX. I have chosen to use the popular format. If however you prefer GNU Linux instead, please perform the mental search and replace while reading this book. I won't mind. So the reason I really, really love that is because we're not calling it GNOME Linux. We're not calling it KDE Linux. You know, I mean, there's a lot of other contributors to the project that would have nothing to do with GNU. So calling it GNU Linux, the justification for calling it GNU Linux is unfounded. And it's kind of makes me get bent out of shape when 
particularly boomer people kind of bring that up, which he's not. So I thought, oh no, boomerism is continuing in that particular negative regard. Um, all right, so there he is. Uh, I'm going to forgive Andy. Uh, I'm sure you're awesome. He's definitely smart. I mean, that's not the issue. <laughs> Say, yeah. <laughs> okay, boomer. Um, Linux Proton Mail Bridge Download. We talked about that. Um, and I'm going to keep that there. Uh, we have a little, a little bit of time left. Um, oh, my hoodies are coming today. Awesome. Um, so I did want to show you this this news, this news another mailing list uh, that I think you should join. Um, if you go out to Google and you search for Google Groups, you can find the, um, the do, 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 where is it? show details. It's called the JavaScript Sites in Search. It's a little small, uh, but it's called JavaScript Sites in Search Working Group. And if you want to read further justification of my conclusions about things that are using single page apps and, and at, they're basically turning their documentation into applications and then they're complaining because the documentation on their site is no longer being found by Google. And this, this is one of these every other day. So I, I go over them a lot. Um, and it talks, out, talks about that sort of thing. So we're not going to talk about that more. I just want to bring it to your attention. All right. Um, I'm going to turn to Twitter uh, for the next half hour. And you're like, well, Twitter? What's Twitter about? Well, Twitter and Reddit are actually really good sources um, for stuff. Um, and you just have to make sure you're following the right people, right? And and I follow a lot of people, and I'm going to say it again. I think the best people to follow on Twitter are those who follow the most people, not those who have the fewest followers or more fo the most followers and they follow the fewest people. You want people who are connected. You're looking for people who care, who like you know, curate through all of this stuff for you, like I'm going to do, and then show you everything. So, oh, I got a notification. What is that? Reply, okay, better. Interesting. Um, all right, so we're going to go through the bookmarks that I actually went through. I didn't want to trouble you with everything. So I went ahead and went through my, my Twitter yesterday uh, while, you know, doing other things, and I just bookmarked a bunch of them that I wanted to show and talk about. And so I'm going to go through them really fast. In fact, during Coffee Talk, you're generally going to hear me working going through things pretty quickly so here we go uh where so hannah said chapter one if it's important enough to you you will find a way if it's not you will find an excuse so i think that needs to go in our in our chat list um here we have there is uh let's see there's so much money in startup land that few can imagine a drastic bu bubble burst, but the last few months have felt like a reckoning for the most hyped up cash burn companies with layoffs, shutdowns, and uncertainty. So here is another article. This is the same article referred to in the other one, and it talks about how startups are, are busting. And the way, why do you care? So I'm going to keep asking myself that question. Why do you care? You care because this means that you have got to keep your skills across the board sharp, specifically Linux. If you keep your Linux skills up, you can double as a systems guy or girl. You can work in operations department instead of the applications department. And when you do your applications development, you'll be all the much better for it because you are using Linux and you're able to test all your stuff. Okay, so you care about the fact that the startup boom is busting because that means all the money is leaving applications development temporarily and it's going to go into maintaining what you already have, what they already have. And that money is systems administration, DevOps, you know, SRE, um, you know, site reliability engineering, Linux uh, and cybersecurity. All of those things will continue to get money no matter what because they can't stop paying for those things. By the way, if you want a reasonably stable career more than you want big money learn to be somebody on the operations side of the of the IT department more than the application side but if you have application skills when the economy is good the applications people make gobs and gobs of money because everybody is paying to beat out their competition and they're paying the for top dollar for 10x programmers so if you you know so if you have both skills you can have the reliability of an operations career while still making, you know, the occasional big money as an applications developer. Okay. If you're in the applications developer space, though, when you hit a bust like this, like we're going through, like we had in 2000 as well, then you're in trouble. You better hope you made a lot of money as an applications developer during that time because there's a good chance you're not going to have a job. Okay. A lot of people are having trouble in the software applications uh, development space. Now, there's still a massive, massive drought of talent. So most people in that space still don't need to really worry about it. They're going to be okay. Most applications developers um, who are you know senior are are still going to be able to go someplace else where there is money. I don't. I still believe that it's not nearly as bad as it was in 2000. However, when people suddenly get their budget cut, doesn't matter how good you are, they have to let you go. 
because they don't have money anymore. So when that happens, you know, if you can, if you can cross over to the ops, you're safer. I spent a lot of time talking about that this morning because I have mentioned it in the past and it seems to be a pretty significant thing happening in our industry right now. And you care because you need to prepare for it. And a lot of you are making decisions about what skills you're going to learn now, how you're going to, I call it, invest your mind share. And I believe very strongly that the safest bet right now is Linux and systems administration and, you know, shell scripting and cybersecurity above applications development. It doesn't mean you can't not learn web. You have to learn how to be a cybersecurity person and a bug bounty person. But, you know, Linux is a solid, solid, solid foundation. All right. So, uh, all right. So let's keep going here. Um, it doesn't seem to matter how expensive cybercrime is, despite heavy fine payouts, the amount, the amount of breaches continues to rise. Okay, so there is big money, and, and I just, the reason, why do you care? The money that's in cybersecurity is going to be paid out no matter what, okay? So companies, you know, they want to keep their systems up, and cybercrime is designed on keeping their systems down. That means no matter what, they're going to be paying for it. They're either going to be forced to pay it through government, you know, depending on the house, the size of the company, or they're going to be paying it to recover. All right. And if you're black hat, you can force them to pay you. <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. We lost our only black hat on the stream. He was here for the first week or so. Um, yeah. All right. So let's see here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right. Uh, black Panther. I really like this. This is a democracy now. Black Panther star Letitia, Letitia Wright isn't just a tech genius on screen. She's inspiring young girls to pursue STEM careers in, 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 careers in STEM. Uh, I, one of my members, one of my community members comes from... Hey! Oh, hey, there we go. Uh, lost lost your only black hat, at Rob. <laughs> well, then we might have a few others, but I'm pretty sure he was, he was black hat. He was funny. Um, so Letitia is a... Um, is a is a uh, an actress from uh, Black Panther, which I really love. I actually I actually think Black Panther was was perfectly timed. Um, N uh, Nagios N A G I O S uh, Nagios has been constantly coming in my stream. Actually, not so much now, but boy, I tell you what, two years ago they were in my stream all the time in my search results and my search alerts because they are really really beefing up computer education in their country. And I got to tell you, they are gonna bury a lot of other emerging countries because they're able, they're in a position where they can decide what it's going to look like, what their education system is going to look like. And they are building their, their educational system on a foundation of technology. So in very many, very real ways, countries like Nagios in, in Lagos, sorry, I, Lagos, Lagos, I say that right, I apologize. Um, and we have, I have a, I have a, um, a boy from Africa here who, who actually is from Africa. And, and they go back regularly. And I got to tell you, he's, he's, he's probably at least my top five most committed people here. He has his own servers. He's taught himself his own AI, uh, machine learning stuff. And um, so, you know, this, this idea that, that Africa is in any way behind us on the tech curve is totally wrong. And um, there's a lot, of, a lot of evidence to suggest that, they're, that they actually could even be, you know, um, part of the new, um, you know, even to compete with India on that front. Um, there's actually a plot line in Mr. Robot where um, White Rose, who's the antagonist, tries to bring his project to the Congo because the, down, you know, there's a lot of land down there where people can kind of do whatever they want. And um, this is all kind of playing together. Um, okay, so let's see here. Uh, time to pursue an international cyber threat. Um, the National Cybersecurity and Communication Integration Center um, uh, let's see here. Oh, cyber treaty. So this is, there's a full blown war going on that people don't know about. And this is worth reading. Um, I don't know if I can share my bookmarks. I wonder if I can do that. That would be kind of fun. So time to pursue an international cyber treaty. This, there's, there's a war going on. And if you want to be a participant, you need to go into cybersecurity. Um, all right. RS will RS will accept no cybersecurity standards. I pointed out that right now you can have a voting machine uh, with blah, 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 connection to the Internet, which is the equivalent of stashing ballots in the Kremlin. And the RS objected and sat down. Ron Wyden. So Senator Ron Wyden, the GOP, is making a mockery of election security. 
Uh, they use Google Forms to submit their results. That was actually not just the GOP. You know, the Democrats are doing just as bad. So don't get, you know, <laughs> I mean, they're bad too, but they're all bad. The, the, the technology involved with the voting is just a joke. We're going to get totally controlled. Um, Jamstack. So here's a, here's the thing about Jamstack. If you don't know what Jamstack is, go to jamstack.org and read all about it. Um, we will, I will do a video on it eventually. I don't have one right now. Um, but there are lots of presentations on Netlify about Jamstack. So if you want to get a sense of this last night, uh, we put together a website pretty quickly using Jamstack technologies. Um, and there's still more to do there. Uh, they'll do form processing, all kinds of things. Bob Carver, should all children learn to code by the end of high school? So the answer is no. And um, I, I have a kind of a contrarian opinion here. Uh, I, don't, I do not believe it's a good idea uh, to force everybody to learn to code. And that is very, very much against what everybody says. Uh, this is a pretty good article, but I'm not going to, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to keep going. Um, the reason being is not everybody should become a programmer. Maybe everybody should learn to think like a computer and think logically, but there's lots of things that teach logical thinking that don't have anything to do with computers, particularly foreign language, math, you know, things like that, sciences. So I do not agree that every single person should learn to code. Um, I, I think you'll be better off for it and you'll be more empowered, but, I, but there are some people that may not necessarily want to do that or be good at it, and they can learn analytical thinking in other ways. The idea that you have to learn how to code because it teaches you how to think, those are Steve Jobs' exact words, is wrong. You know, it, it, there are many ways to learn how to think besides coding. And, and everybody is jumping on this coding thing. And now, finally, we're starting to read some people say, well, you know, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not everybody needs to learn to code Python and Java, right? We do need to, little, to think, think analytically to break things down, but algebra teaches that. So, you know, I, I, I don't agree. So, um, C failure is it's Richard Feynman. He's, of course, you know, pretty famous. Uh, I like these quotes, or his little top ten Let's see failure is the beginning. Never stop learning, of course. Assume nothing, question everything, of course. Teach others what you know. Analyze objectively. Uh, practice humility. Respect constructive criticism. Take initiative. Give credit where it's due and love what you do. I mean, that's that was a really great top ten. Um, all right. Uh, say versus mean. Um... Do you ever say something but totally mean something different? I do it all the time. Uh, <laughs> but the reason this is in here is because of dev.to. I'm just going to put it out there. I have rarely found anything valuable on dev.to. And the very, the very value proposition of dev.to is that we all need a place, all developers need a place to go write blogs. Bothers me. You know, we don't need that. You don't need that. Go make your own blog and then share your blog and link it to others. You don't need a central place for this. And um, so I have asked to remove, I mean, the content on dev.to is regularly really wrong, like wrong, wrong. And it, it seems like it's a place for a bunch of beginners to come, like, try to, I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know what they're doing. But they go here and they're, they're blogging all the time. And not that particular blogger. I haven't read her full article, so I don't. I don't mean any ill will toward her, but it's just, you know, the idea that people go there and beginners are drawn to it is as bad as Stack Exchange. Stack Exchange is full of like really serious errors that would get you fired, but there's no filter, and there's a lot of great answers too. So, I guess why do you care? You should care because you should read every single thing with. A critical mind just like this assume nothing question everything if everybody thinks node is the best thing and react is the best thing since sliced bread question it go find out for yourself what is the architecture look under the hood see what it does find out your own your own things don't go with the sheep off the cliff figure shit out on your own and if you'll be better off for it i'm not talking i don't i'm not saying be contrarian you know like <laughs> take everything on i'm saying you know Respect, respect constructive criticism, you know, be nice about it. So anyway, some coffee, a little bit of break with some music for our last round. We have a few minutes left. I think all of our music is gone, though. Where did my music go? I killed my music. 
Oh, here, put some more music. Oh, that's kind of loud. Hmm. Okay, back here we go. So, uh, Twitter. Okay, what's written in a letter might be might be right in an inbox. I thought this was really fascinating stuff. So this says that you should keep all your emails under five sentences, which I regularly break. <laughs> <laughs> and my emails don't work. So I was like, hmm, okay, why do you care? Because people don't read long email, end of story. And I can tell you for a fact they don't because I send emails to parents and pass the first sentence and they don't read it, even though I you know, spent a lot of time writing stuff, constructing it. There's another saying that um, if I'd had more time, I'd have sent you a shorter email. That uh, kind of speaks to the value of, of um, editing. <laughs> and And that goes for streamers too right how can i and i want you to know i'm thinking about y'all i mean i went ahead and made a list of these bookmarks rather than just read all the inane ones that we're gonna have to skip past because that waste all of our time so so at least these are ones that i felt were worthy of, of you know discussing possibly this is pretty cool apple to release the first arm mac without intel processor in the next 18 months and this was a, this was kind of a given um i I've been saying this for two or three years since they started putting the arms in the computers. Um, they And since Mac OS reports to the iOS division, if you didn't know that, that's an interesting fact. So some time ago, uh, Mac, the Apple put the Mac OS team, the team responsible for the operating system and all the, you know, your laptops and everything, everything but iPad and iPhone. And they put their entire team under the iPad team, the iOS team. So the iOS team now controls the decisions that are made on the Mac OS team. And so then what you get things like getting rid of the escape key, you get these little widgets that are at the top of the thing. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> my name here, reactive nodes suck, SQL is overrated. In fact, you should never use JS. If you can't do it with HTML, CSS, you shouldn't do it. Is it contrary enough for you? That's funny, my name here, because I know a lot of people who hold that position and I am almost there with you. Unless you have a, a really solid need to use JavaScript, you should not reach for it. And what we're seeing now with Gatsby and the other bloggers, be pressing thing, is people are reaching for JavaScript before they even decide that, that what they could be that what they could do would work in HTML and CSS. And I there's a little bit of a riff there that we won't get into now, but I've talked about it a lot on the stream. So um, there's a question here I missed. Is cybersecurity an industry that a person can get into fairly easily without a degree? Um, you cannot. Uh, so cybersecurity definitely needs certificates. Um, what I would suggest is that you um, get, uh, I did a video called uh, Why Certify, and it talks about that. Um, the If you want to get the fastest path into cybersecurity, I call it hacking the system with WGU. Uh, WGU is a university online where you can go get a cybersecurity degree in as fast as you can work. There's a guy there who got his computer science degree in six months, um, So, and it's an accredited institution. This isn't like some Trump U or something. So you can actually go there. Yeah. Well, th it is actually... Yeah, no, the React stuff is true. There's like a there's like an entire uh, group of people on the whole React position who are very, very, very in agreement with that position. And you can find them on CodePen, actually. There's people who are very proud of the fact that they can make an X-Wing fly around the screen with no JavaScript using CSS only. So um, the thing about CSS and HTML is it works everywhere. And uh, any, let's, be, well, let's put it that <laughs> anywhere there's not graphics, right? So Lynx doesn't like it necessarily. So um, let me return back to the point here. So Apple has got an ARM processor. It's just a matter of time. Um, ARM is also the IoT platform. Uh, this is really, really becoming clear. So um, we've actually removed uh, teaching microchip PIC uh, programming to people instead uh, programming uh, in Go and C for ARM because that's where IoT is going, is already at actually. And so Apple is about to release. They have for a while there Apple had was it they had I can't remember the name Apple had the most powerful arm chip on the planet for a while and um, they're putting a lot of money into arm and the fact that iOS uh, the iOS division is pretty much running the show over there uh, you know the writings on the wall how that's going to go down so yeah let's see a comment I like react because I because I don't like jQuery perhaps a new position no jQuery is old you shouldn't use it react is a bastardized, frankenized monster that nobody should use unless they're making apps. Okay, if you're making apps, go for it. 
use React. I, I, I personally prefer Vue because React just thumbs its nose at emerging standards such as JSX. JSX is a bastard, you know, it's just a bastardized Frankenstein monster. It's absolutely horrible. J, I mean, JS, JSX should be shot and put out of its misery. <laughs> it's so horrible. It's exactly what I would expect from a Facebook engineering team. Exactly. <laughs> and who has, doesn't have a very good track record, by the way. Um, I like React because I don't like it. Yeah. All right. Types of cyber attacks. I thought this was cool. Um, so this does show the different types of data breaches, malicious code, software exploits. Um, I'm realizing right now that I'm going to need to put these not only in a bookmarks list, but I'm going to need to put them in like a coffee talk list of some kind. I need to figure out some way for you guys to, to read all the links from the, from the chat and I'll figure that out. Um, I don't think you can see my bookmarks. Can you see a person's bookmarks? Does anybody know? Can you see a person's Twitter bookmarks? I'll have 10 minutes. Um, I'll, I'll figure that out later. So, so this is some big, big news. So the RSA conference, uh, conference uh, security conference is going on right now. And there's a bunch of tweets that are talking about Hacker One, like it's really promoting it. Um, and so, yeah, that's a thing. Conference, you know, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot more buzz around bug bounty going on, um, just in general. Uh, course Report, Flatiron. So Course Report is an organization that um, claims, and I believe now that they are lying, uh, to show you all the good boot camps out there. Well, there's a bunch of these people who claim to be kind of a, you know, a, a consumer reports thing. In fact, they're getting paid. And if you don't believe me, just go watch Adam Ruins Anything. It's like all over the place. So um, Flatiron, yeah, they're, they're paid for sure. Um, Flatiron is shit. And you should run screaming from Flatiron. Um, and I, I can t I'm going to back that up. So Flatiron, Flatiron was sued by the state of New York for, and they lost for $150,000 for operating without a license and for misrepresenting their job placement numbers. And then they got bought by WeWork. And if you don't know about the billion dollar immense disaster that WeWork is, go watch the documentary on it. Okay. So uh, because they were flailing, they were about to die. And so of course we work swoops in, buys them up. And you know, we work as a total complete objective disaster. And if you want anything to do with, we work, you need to like really reevaluate your position because it's a mess. Yeah. Um, giving it interest free loans for pickups. You know what else they did? They destroyed a bunch of mom and pop like mentoring programs all over. They would they would aggressively go out and hand out flyers in front in front of, you know, mentored communities and private schools, and they destroyed all of the smaller companies that were out there. And then they collapsed completely. And they are they are the the epitome of evil. And and if you are a WeWork person and you're there, I never want you to tell me because I will be unable to preserve my sanity and not judge you. <laughs> okay, so so just you know, just don't Flatiron too. Flatiron is one of the worst schools ever. They're they are taking advantage of people constantly, and they are regularly posting bad things. And they're now obviously paying Course Report to make up for that. Now, I don't remember where they are. First of all, I, just reevaluate your position if you're even thinking about a boot camp. You can learn everything in a boot camp on your own if you're dedicated. If you're dedicated. And if you don't, I mean, you can come back here and I can talk to you or somebody else can help talk you through it. You don't need to go to a boot camp. You can learn. The one thing that Free Code Camp got right is the premise that you can get a job, you can get the skills without paying eight grand for a boot camp. Yep. And if you go, if you go to a boot camp and you're still struggling to get a job, join the club. I mean, I, I meet him. I met, told the story about one that I met, uh, at the pub. And there are some people that go to boot camps who get jobs right away. And that's really great. The, the only boot camp that I'm currently, I've been watching them for a long time. And the only boot camp that I personally feel like has legs is Lambda school. And they don't make any money unless you're, you know, there. Um, I've talked to you about the recurse center which is a, uh, they call it a coder retreat, like in the same sense as a writing retreat. Um, so, you know, um, but these, these things are designed to get your money and let you go. And they, they, there's no follow-up. There's no, they're not, they're not trying to, um, it's for artists. It's actually not. The Recurse Center is for, um, so if you're in New York, God bless, I mean, this is one of the, there's a few things that I personally like 
crave going to. I would give so much. I would love to get into recurse. I'm kind of afraid of applying because I don't want to get rejected. You get rejected, you never get to get in. But um, so you should read about it. It's called the recurse center.com, recurse.com. General Assembly, you know, you know, I don't know. General Assembly goes back and forth between being, I'll tell you what, General Assembly is one of the biggest ones that's conglomerating all the other ones. So they're still around. Um, but I'm, but they're still using the model of you don't get it. You, you pay up front, go into massive debt and then come back. Um, which one? Hackers? No, the Recurse Center is not for hackers. This is, this is why they changed their name. It used to be Hacker School and it was never just for hackers. It was always for coders. So, so yeah, you can go read this thing. Um, yeah, I, you know, guys, we're going to talk, we don't have much time, but we're going to, we should probably talk about where the thinking comes from that says that you have to go to a place and go get your, we need to help you learn to, to have more confidence in your own learning ability. Some people feel like they need a schedule and they need to have their own curriculum and everything, but you can actually do that. You can do that. You know, you can curate the content, you can develop your own curriculum, and then you can learn on your own. And, and all the process, that process of going through it might seem like it's, like it's daunting and like it's impossible for you to do. It won't cost you nearly as much money, you know, because you'll be paying for books at the most, right? Even Udemy and stuff like that, you don't need to do. What you need to do is you need to formulate your own plan, take it to a professional or two or three or four, and then, and then, okay, it is one of those ones that get you paid when you get a job. Okay. Don't even look at a boot camp unless that's their policy. I, I believe that so strongly because you are both, everybody is financially financially incented for you to succeed. Any other boot camp, whether it's offered through your college or anything like that, is financially incented to get your money and let you go. And they're not being regulated. They're not, they're, nobody's checking the job placement. Nobody's checking whether you learned anything. It's absolutely dangerous. I need to know what I need to learn. Right. So that's the biggest problem. Okay. But here's the problem. Here's, here's the thing. Okay. So, and and I'm going to end with this because this is really important. So the, the sort of unsurety that you're experiencing, my name here. So, uh, Hey, how's it going, Kip? So we're just doing coffee talk. I'm going to, you can go read, you can go watch all this will be online in a second. So let me just make this final point for this morning. When you give in to the idea that you need somebody or something to teach you and show you what to learn. That could be me. It could be anybody else. You, you are experiencing, you're, you're suffering from a lack of a very, very critical skill. One of the most critical skills that all humans need to learn. They need to learn continuous learning. They need to learn to curate their own information. They need to learn to know what to know. And if you don't know how to learn that, Stop everything else and learn that. Because if you don't learn that, you're fucked for the rest of your life. I mean, pardon my French. But if you, if you don't learn how to, how to know what to learn and how to do it and how to execute your own learning, which means curating the content, you know, ex- practicing projects, doing some reading, self-evaluation, self-assessment. If you don't learn those skills, none of the other skills matter. Because you will constantly be called on to use those skills in a professional environment or not. So if you go to a boot camp, pay your eight grand and don't know those skills, and I would argue that the people who are successful when they come out of boot camps either already had those skills or they acquire them somehow from the boot camp indirectly because they're not directly taught. And so they go on to be successful. The people who don't, just tell me what to do. Am I going to get a job? How long is it going to take? Those are the questions those kind of people ask. They ask those questions constantly. So, so, so if I pay you $800, does this mean I'm going to get a job? No, <laughs> it's not, you know, they, cause they're not taking responsibility for the learning. So, so that's actually one thing that I really, really get behind. I'm, I'm in agreement with Quincy on, on the free code camp guy, because he's like, dude, you don't need to pay for a boot camp for this stuff. And people who have been homeschooled, they get it, you know, they get it. They know it. They're like, why would I pay money for that? You know, so I'm not saying that you don't need people who know you need to find mentors and you can usually find them for free. And by the way, the Boy Scouts got this right. Right. Say when you go to get a merit badge in the Boy Scouts, what do you do? Right. You go to get a merit badge. You sign up for a merit badge counselor. He signs your card saying, I'm now your merit badge counselor. He says, go do these things. You do all these things that are written down really well. And they're already written for you in that case. So you don't have to write them. You perform on those skills. You get 
you get them and then you go back to, you know, you go back to the guy. I'm going to put this up here so I can look at you all. Um, you get to go back to your marriage batch council and say, hey, see what I did? Your marriage batch council doesn't lose a lot of time. It goes, wow, that's really cool. Ooh, that's a little bit wrong. Oh, uh, oh I got here. Oh, you might want to consider this, right? And so you have to have people who know, but you don't have to. The thing that's really sad, this is the saddest part about boot camps and education in general. And I had the director of web and game simulation technology for a university that shall not be named. Tell me over a couple of beers, he had never once made a web page and he was responsible for all their curriculum development for the entire college. I mean, picking it, identifying people. He taught many, many classes on it. Never once had he done it himself. And that's not an unusual story. I'm not kidding you. That is not an unusual story. If you dig deep enough, and it's hard, but if you dig deep enough, most professional organizations, most professional academic and educational organizations are teaching things they do not know. And you can tell the difference. You know, there's a math teacher that comes to mind from a school that I used to teach at who was obsessed with math. He would do it in his spare time. He was a fantastic teacher. History teacher, same thing. Make up their own games to teach history. And then you have what? You have all the other teachers that are just doing it, and it's a job, and they don't even know it. Okay? So the problem with the boot camp model or the education model in general is you have people who don't know who are teaching, people who could not do the skill. Now, I'm not saying there's, 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 there's I believe, a false statement in the world where people will say, um, what is it, um, people who don't know teach. And I don't think that's fair. I really don't think that's fair. And I, I've been the butt of that sometimes because, I mean, I've clearly been successful in my career. I, I did fine. But, but you know, when people see you as a teacher and you're in tech and you introduce yourself in a meetup or something, it's like, oh, yeah, I teach, I retired, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you're washed up. You don't do anything anymore. You obviously don't know. I actually know more, ironically. I actually know more now that I'm not working for the corporation and I have time to keep up more than I ever do while I was working there. So the truth is, in my particular case, I feel like I know more. And it's not just me. There's other educators who've, who have who've kept up and they've used their retirement for that. So why do you care? You care because if you don't learn how to learn, continuous learning, and there's a tweet on this, actually, if I can find her. I'm going to end with this one, actually. Where is she? She's down here, Caitlin. Caitlin's one of my favorite new new programmers to follow. And she, uh, it's been fun watching her career, you know, kind of remotely from the sidelines as she posts about stuff. Um, but she, she talks about this very thing. I hope I can find it. There she is. Okay. So, so this is a little, and we'll end with this tweet today, this morning. Uh, I can't access your bookmarks. Okay. Here's Caitlin. She's just so adorable. And, you know, and she's, she's, she's sometimes, she's, she's very, public with with her her career path and she went to a boot camp and she's like trying to get a job and she's like she struggles because she went to the boot camp and she talks about it but she's you know been learning and I love I just love some of the stuff that she says she says if you're an aspiring developer what can I specifically do to help you and she was asking what to do and I suggested to, to mentor you know seek out a mentor at one point and now she's turning around and doing the same thing to others so so this is definitely something to follow if you're just breaking in you, might, you know, if you, there's something to be said for, you know, bonding together with people who are just like you, who are trying to break into the business and, and collaborating on that. So, uh, let's see, any tips on how to get a developer position after years of informal development? VBA professional, Python R, academically, most boot camps seem for undergrads or those who can afford not to not have a job for a few months. And by the way, if you're managing your own learning, you don't have to take any time off. You just have to do a schedule like me and carve out some time and maybe stream it. Maybe stream your learning. Just own it. I'm new. I'm learning. Stream it. You'll get people come in there like, oh, hey, what are you doing? What are you learning here? And they'll help you out. And that's a great, the great miracle of the Internet, really. Right. So here we go. Um, and then this is the best answer of all. And I'm going to end with this. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be able to take a few months off. So she did that. And that's not always an option. But. I think at the end of the day, your portfolio speaks for itself. Now, she's specifically a software developer, so it's very important to understand that. If you're a software developer, it's all about trust and output and portfolio. If you're an operations person, cybersecurity, system administrator, it's all about certification and education and experience. 
So try to get three to four solid projects in there and practice coding challenges online to prep for attack. I don't necessarily agree with that one, but um, this is another one. Oh, I love this one. Would you have done anything different during your boot camp time or focus more specifically on I began I begin mine in May? I just think I would have tried. This is the one I was looking for, actually. I just think I would have tried to be more patient with myself and the process. I felt like I was never learning enough. I was never learning fast enough to get a job. But now I really see how much continuous learning, and this is now, I'm stealing this word from Caitlin, because everybody talks about continuous integration, continuous deployment, CI, CD, and why not CL, continuous learning. It's just a part of the job description. All right. So, you know, Caitlin is one of the one of the, the best young coders that I've really enjoyed following. Uh, there's many out there, um, and they're all sharing sharing things with each other. Any specific qualities to look for for identifying a mentor? It's funny because, I'm not sure because I really don't have a mentor. It's funny because I recommended, this is how I discovered her. She was just randomly posting on uh, 100 Days of Code, I think. And I said... I said, you know, you might want to go find a mentor. Well, it's really, really hard to find a mentor. But if you can find one, you know, uh, you can do that. But the mentor sometimes doesn't have to be a person. It can be either a coder on GitHub or GitLab, and you can go look at their code, and they're mentoring you indirectly because you're looking at how they've coded things, and you're asking yourself, why did they code it that way? Why is this a thing? And you can control your own research. Anyway, I'm going to read this last comment, and then I really need to be good on my time. Uh, there's nothing really there that I disagree with, but uh, when you have such a broad topic such as programming, knowing what areas to study is difficult because there's so many layers to it, and you can get get by just and you and you can get by by just learning syntax and how to apply it to a project. Yep. But there's nothing about compilers or distributed systems or networking. Nope. And um, uh, Kip, you're new here, so I'll just mention this. Um, what you're describing is exactly what I have been intensely and obsessively focused for seven years my hardest thing is to figure out which what to learn for what jobs so um, I have lots of, of things here um, I think path to full stack engineer is one of my more later ones um, and this is uh, based on information from the Bureau of Labor and Statistics um, that I I developed this this diagram when I had an adult ask me what is the fastest path to a tech career, and I still need to make videos about this because I, I, this is constantly under revision. Uh, this current path shows learning Bash and Linux first, um, and then going off to Web Designer, and that's based on uh, the two years of education required to get a, a 69k job, thousand dollar a year job, uh, with a 13% growth rate to become a JavaScript or a web applications developer. Uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that is the fastest path to a tech career. It's, and I'm, if I'm honest, that's how I started. I started out doing, I mean, really uh, professionally, I started out as a web front end web developer. Got interested in the back end and got kind of pulled into systems administration because I was so interested in Linux in the back end and concluded my career as a, you know an audit compliance guy and digging out you know memory leaks and memory buffer overflows and C code. So you know, but I started 